all this why either preventive maintenance. I know a lot of people will tell us um run to failure, preventive maintenance, predictive maintenance, reactive maintenance, reliability maintenance, and all those sort of type of maintenance. We shall be touching all those areas as well today, but it might not be as detailed as you expect, but majorly the area we're going to be covering today is all all and compass facility maintenance. Then how do you plan maintenance? How do you carry out your maintenance? How do you monitor maintenance? Then after carrying out your maintenance, do you review? And how do you assess your maintenance tax that you've already carried out? And what are the process it's involved? when you want to carry out the maintenance activity, either predictive, preventive, reactive, or any other form of maintenance. So today, these are area we shall be touching one by one. Key consideration, what are the key factors you consider when you are talking about routine maintenance? Maintenance planning process, what are the processes it entails? Planning, execute, control, monitoring and evaluation MIE, maintenance record. These are area we shall be dealing with. So these are more or less like subtopics under facility maintenance uh, and recording. Now, what is maintenance plan? Planning every, every facility operation and maintenance requires planning. These are not something we just us dump into or you just trying to do what we call a fire brigade approach. When you have a very good maintenance plan in place and you ensure you carry out your maintenance activity when it is required, you stand the chance of having what we call safe environment. Then two, you get what we call effectiveness as far as your maintenance or asset is concerned. Then you get what we call efficiency. And also your equipment, your asset becomes reliable. So at least when they are reliable, they are able to perform the tax where which they have been designed for. Then at the same time, we all know that good maintenance culture elongates or it expands or it improves the lifespan of what of an asset. So what is maintenance plan? It is an activity or a kind of a workflow. We start from what? Planning, after planning, you talk about um execution and during execution you talk about monitoring and after you complete your maintenance task you record whatsoever maintenance tasks you have carried out and after recording you still evaluate your maintenance task to see area where you are lagging behind and area where you need some one or two improvements so is a plan on how to carry out a maintenance yes it is a process of carrying out a scheduled service it is a developed task needed to maintain a facility. So all these four mentioned uh, uh, definitions are all good definition for a maintenance plan. Then this is a typical of uh, example of maintenance life cycle. It all starts from what? Assessing the condition of your facility, which is more like asset uh, facility condition assessment we discussed the other time. So once you assess, generate what we call asset register, when you generate asset register, perform your maintenance task, after performing your maintenance task, then the time and schedule for the maintenance activity, then replacement plan. This is an example of a typical maintenance life cycle of a maintenance planning. So maintenance, these are more or less like four quadrants or four horizons of maintenance planning. The one that is short term, the one that is long term, the one that is operational, and the one that is strategic. Your maintenance could be a short term maintenance, which is less than three years. It has to be specific. It is budget related. And these are kind of operational maintenance that you carry out, uh, maintenance that you carry out with your cash flow. It's more or less like a daily routine. So it is operation OPEX, that is operating uh, expenditure. So then the long-term maintenance are more or less like a three years, anything less greater than what three years. It is more or less like a general kind of a maintenance that it might require you to shut down the entire facility or the entire factory or the entire production factory completely, shutting them down to carry out what we call a comprehensive annual or biannual or five years kind of maintenance. So it is general. It's not only one particular equipment, it's not um, streamlined to only one asset. 
it is conceptual and it is investment analysis because it's definitely going to go up a huge amount of money and it is capital expenditure related so that is the difference between your normal daily operation maintenance and your capital expenditure they are also both maintenance. so it's just only that one go up a huge amount of money why so goes sorry sir can you come like again your line is breaking okay can you hear me clearly now Hello. Hello. Please, you can hear me clearly. Can you just unmute yourself and let me confirm? We can hear you clearly. I think you should check his um, network. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, okay, okay. You. Okay, maybe possibly you should try and check your network. Okay, so okay, in terms okay. of operation, you, we can all mute ourselves now. So in terms of operational, when you are dealing with maintenance planning, in terms of operational, you consider the scope of the service that you want to carry it out. What is the objective of that service that you want to carry it out? Then the task and action. Then what are the remedial action? What are the routine maintenance? What are the time scale? The resources requirement and performance indicator. What are the manpower that is required? How many days? How many hours will it take? So these are more or less like operational kind of um, planning because. Like if you're working in a factory, for instance, where you work in a um, bottle, um, bottle water production environment, you when you shut down for an hour, it is it's definitely going to affect production. So if the company is producing like 10,000 bottles of pure water within an hour, so that means during that short down period, definitely you are not only losing money, you are not only losing um uh, production while you are losing money in terms of that 10,000 or 1,000 production is money, is a cost to the company. Then, two, your manpower that is involved it comes at a cost. Then, three, the part you are using comes at a cost. So, that is the reason why that kind of maintenance is more like operational. So, that's why it's involved the scope of the service, the service objective, the task, the remedial action, the routine maintenance, the time scale. Time scale is very, very critical because that will also affect what we call production. Uh, before you know, if it's an environment, the marketer started telling you, sorry, if God have it, you are the um, plant manager. The operation, the marketing started telling you, you are the reason why they couldn't make up what they are six targets. So then you have performance indicator because after you have performed your maintenance uh, task, you need to check if that maintenance task is actually yielding the scope or the objective of that maintenance that you already put in place. Then strategically, your maintenance has to be strategically be in line, vision and mission of the company. Then you have to consider environmental factor, situational analysis, profile of service, goal and objective, link to corporate plan and methodologies through strategy. Methodology involves what are the methods you want to use in performing that maintenance task. Because if it's more or less like something that is going to be a reoccurring maintenance, it must be strategized. You need to put a certain strategy in place in such a way that it will create a, an each free environment for production and availability of your asset at when it is required and when due. So what are your plans? What does your maintenance plans include? One, the detailed description of each of the maintenance tasks. For instance, let's take uh, a, a, bottle, uh, a bottle cover machine, for an example. If I need to perform a kind of maintenance task on that machine, what are what do I need to carry it out? One, if it is a machine that has a coveil, I need to ensure that the coveil is what? Aligned. So that means I'm talking about alignment. Then two, I need to ensure that the number of both uh, cover that I'm wasting is far, far reduced to a minimum zero. Then three, I have to ensure that the machine is being working in such a way that it is not falling off bottles because when it's falling off bottle, I stand the chance of losing a lot of water bottles. Then the machine is also putting all the cover in such a way that it does not affect the tips of the bottle, because it's something we call like a crack. 
So I have to determine what are the kind of tasks I have to carry out on that machine. It's not that I just shut down the particular machine and I don't even know where to start and where I'm going to. I must have drawn up all the description or detail of what I need to do. Then what is the frequency of performing each of those tasks? Then if I am about to perform that task, what are the resources that I need? In terms of manpower, do I need one single technician to carry out that maintenance? Do I need two technicians? Do I need three? Do I need four technical staff? Does it even require me bringing in the supervisor? So most of the time, when you are doing your resources planning, it is not a task that you as a facility manager can perform a lot of times. It will require you as a facility manager to involve yourself as a facility manager, your facility supervisor, your technical teams, then your operation people, because people are actually operating the machine. Then it also requires you to carry out your safety personnel along. So it's something that everybody has to sit down and discuss together. This might even include you carrying out your storekeeper along because the storekeeper will be the one that will tell you the number of spare parts you have on ground that can that will be enough for you to carry out that maintenance task. And if spare parts is not available, how do we quickly make and reordering before we carry out before the due date for that maintenance task? Then equipment condition. What's the condition of the equipment? If the condition is the equipment is still fairly okay, is this something that we can postpone for like a day or like two days or possibly we have a maximum demand from one of our major customer and we have to satisfy this customer with this customer that we cannot want, we cannot disappoint. You as a facility manager, you are the one that needs to get back to the operation people or you need to get back to the marketing people or you need to back, get back to the management that, okay, this equipment can still serve us for one or two days. The condition of the equipment is not as critical. But when it is critical, you don't have an option, you need to shut down and perform your maintenance task. Then what is the type of the maintenance task you need to perform? Is it preventive? Is it predictive? Is it reactive maintenance or whatever? So you need to determine the type you are going to what, perform. You know definitely when you are performing your preventive, it requires you to shut down the entire system. Predictive might not require shutting down the entire system because you are only monitoring the condition of the equipment. Predictive doesn't mean that the equipment has finally break down. Then tax delivery time. If we are to shut down, how many hours will it take? If I'm working in a production environment, this is very, very key. The timeline of performing a maintenance task is very, very key because operations want to ensure that they always produce, meet their daily production targets. Marketers, salespeople, they want to ensure that when they needed um, uh, products, they have their product at their disposal so that they don't disappoint customer because company is definitely going to lose money when you cannot meet up your demand. So delivery time, the time it takes you to troubleshoot, to repair the equipment and put the equipment back to operation or to service the equipment and put it back to operation is very, very key. What are the tools and equipment required? Then what care of the equipment and the system do you have to put in place? This is area where you need your safety team. The tools that the equipment require is at the area where you need a very good inventory of your spare parts, a good inventory of your tools, a good inventory of even your, including your team. Then even among your team, who are the people you can assign to do that job that you are so sure that if you assign one hour for that task, two guys can easily make sure that they complete that task within a frame of that one hour. These are what your plan should include when you are planning your maintenance uh, maintenance, uh, when you are drawing up your maintenance uh, plan, then what is the purpose of maintenance plan? Why do we have to draw a maintenance plan? Every other thing they say, when you plan, when you fail to plan, you plan to fail. That is what we have. So that means definitely when you fail to plan, as far as maintenance is concerned, you are also planning to fail because your maintenance plan guarantees you the facility functionality. The facility function is, it guarantees you that the, your facility is functioning safely, effectively, and what? Efficiently. Then it reduces the possibility of hazard and accident because you know what to do at the right time. You don't wait until when your covered bed or your uh, uh, sprocket chain or any of those mechanical uh, moving objects snaps before you start maintaining them. You don't wait until your uh, teeth and gear started wearing out before you what you start maintaining them before you start putting where where area where you need to put grease. You don't wait until when your um, fleet um, brake pad 
got one out before you started what? Getting another what? Break part to replace. Because when you fail replacing your break part, what you are causing is that you are causing a frictional, uh, frictional effect between your brake pad and your uh, drum disc on your wheel. Then how often do you check your fleet brakes, the braking system? How often do you ensure that they are in good condition? Do you top the brake oil when it is required? Do you ensure that somebody is even checking the status of the tires for your fleet? So when you put all this in place, when you have a good maintenance plan in place, it helps you to reduce hazard and accident. So you don't wait until when you are on speed and your tire pulls before you conduct what we call wheel alignment or wheel balancing. Then it reduces disruption of service. So your equipment doesn't just break down abruptly. Because if you have a very good maintenance culture in place, you prevent a lot of maintenance hazard. Then it also preserves your facility system. It reduces your maintenance cost because when you are doing a fire brigade approach maintenance kind of a thing, you spend a huge amount of money in terms of maintenance. Then it extends the useful life on an asset. Optimum availability and reliability of facility system. Then it helps you to make an informed decision on the system in terms of, okay, do I need to do repair? Do I need to replace equipment or do I need to conduct what we call a renewal? So these are the purpose of a good maintenance plan. Then what is the benefit? What do you stand to gain when you maintain a very good maintenance plan? It is easier for you to budget for future what maintenance, cost saving, cost, reduce cost of overtime because when you have a very good plan in place, it's not that a task that two labor can easily carried out you eventually put in five labels there but your good maintenance plan will help you to draw up the uh to draw up the line to know exactly the number of manpower you're going to put for a particular task then better maintenance workflow so you know where to start and how to speed up whatever so you know that okay if i'm maintaining an air condition how many hours will it take me where am i going to start from okay the first thing is that i shut down power to the air conditioning after shutting down that power I have to like open the air condition, remove the air filter, wash the air filter clean, dry it, replace it back, and replace the cover back. These are processes that you have to like follow. Then after that, and I've ensured that the cover is intact and completely secured, I can put on the equipment back. Then this is more or less area where you also need your safety people because this is area where you perform what we call uh, tag in and tag out, or possibly you are conducting a maintenance on your um, LV panel, that's your low voltage panel. You have to completely shut down the panel. And when you shut down, you tag out so that you put a padlock. Nobody just suddenly go there to go and put on the equipment. Then after you complete your work, you put it, uh, you put it on back. That is a, it's, that is one of the benefits of what a good maintenance plan because you'll be able to manage your workflow very well. Then faster execution of maintenance, of planned maintenance action, decreases in equipment downtime. Reduce the major repair on equipment. Reduce premature replacement of parts and components. It also increases the life expectancy of the equipment. Regular equipment maintenance, avoidance of future larger problem on equipment because when you maintain a very good maintenance culture, breakdown becomes more or less like negligible. It's not that your equipment is not going to break down, but you know that all the breakdown you are recording are like legitimate breakdown, not like the unwanted kind of breakdown. So it ensures that the equipment warranty are being maintained because you know you have the detail of the equipment. So when there is need for you to claim warranty on spare parts, you know where to go and who to contact. It keeps the facility running effectively and efficiently. It also helps you being abreast of small issues. So before the issue even snaps, you're already at the point of getting the issue resolved because it is you give your equipment a close contact and a close monitoring. What are the guide in drawing up a maintenance planning? One, determine the scope of the maintenance program. What do you actually want to achieve in conducting that kind of maintenance plan? If I have a bottler or I have a boiler, what are the scope of maintenance that I need to carry it out? I need to ensure that the, all the elements of the boilers are working. How do I ensure that? That must, I must ensure that maybe possibly on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, 
or possibly on 33 day basis, I have to shut down the, uh, the boiler, remove all the elements, and ensure I clean the surrounding, the surroundings of the element, so that I don't have a lot of fouling on the element. This is a result of hardness of the water, which can be causing what we call fouling on the element. And once you have a lot of foul, fouling, um, uh, fouling uh, elements settled on the uh, fouling, um, fouling chemicals settled on the element. It increases the number, uh, it increases the current intake of the element because that means the element has to work extra hour to overcome those skills on it in order to get the water inside the boiler what, um, boil on time. And if that is not being done on a regular basis, you stand the chance of replacing the element on a regular basis. And this doesn't come free, it comes at a cost. Or possibly you have a generator. What are the scope of maintenance you want to be carrying out on that generator? Okay, if you need to remove the engine at every 200 hours, at every 250 hours, or at every 500 hours. There are generators that you service at every 500 hours. Just only that the kind of engine oil you use for the 250 hours is different from the kind of engine you use for the 500 hours. If I'm maintaining a generator on the oil rig, I think I'll prefer to go on the 500 hours basis because it gives me enough room. So the generator, I know, the generator can still run for like at least a month or two months thereafter before I'll think about scheduling a what a routine maintenance. So the scope of the maintenance asset wise will determine the scope of the maintenance program you have to draw for that kind of asset. Then the set time, a good understanding of your asset or detailed knowledge about your asset to tell you what is the time frame that it takes me takes you to perform a particular kind of maintenance on that asset. These are the guide you need or require when you want to draw up your maintenance plan. The resources allocation, who, how many manpower do I require? What are the spare parts that I need? What are the uh, bigger equipment or bigger uh, machine that I need in performing that maintenance task? You are actually need a total shutdown. You need to develop what we call a maintenance checklist. A maintenance checklist is used before, during, and after. Before you embark on a maintenance task, you use a checklist to, which confirm that all the required tools that you needed to perform that task are already on ground. The um, spare parts are already available. The manpower is available. Then you've already drawn up your schedule. That's the reason why if you get to most factory, after the facility manager, we still have a maintenance planner. In some, in some factory, they have maintenance planner, they have maintenance scheduler. They have maintenance supervisor and you have your maintenance guy. So all of them work together and report to the facility manager. So when you are drawing up your maintenance plan, you need all this, your team, you need your planner, you need your scheduler, you need your inventory guy, you need your technicians. Then most of the time you need your operation people because they are the one that will tell you when best they can shut down the, the, um, the, 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 the factory for you. And when they can shut down for you, and just walk up to the factory and tell them, sorry, I want to shut down. No, it doesn't work that way. Then during the conduction of the maintenance, you still use another checklist to keep monitoring how work is being going on. Then after the tax has already been performed, the other checklist you do is more or less like a safety checklist. Okay, the safety, uh, uh, the safety devices on the machine. Are they intact where you need to have a guard? You have the guard working. Where you need to have a, a face sheet or a screen sheet, it is already intact. So you ensure that everything is already in order before you can ask the operator to start operating the equipment. Then you create a maintenance schedule, then maintenance record after you have performed your maintenance task. Then you record whatsoever you have done. And that maintenance task becomes what closed. So when you open a maintenance task, you close that maintenance task. So that is these are the guides that you need to like consider when you are drawing up your maintenance plan. Then the key consideration: one, physical asset and inventory. You need to differentiate between an asset and inventory. So, in order to save you a lot of time, you don't draw up maintenance plan for inventory. 
because your inventory in terms of your maintenance or your facility maintenance are more or less like your spare parts that you're going to use in carrying out your maintenance. Possibly your contactor, your gear, your grease, your engine oil, your refrigerant gas, what are the tools and all those stuff. Those are more or less like your inventory. Then inventory is different from the particular asset. So you need to, those are what you need to consider different between an asset and an inventory. So when you have considered that, in planning for the facility maintenance, you need to identify all assets, identify inventory. Every asset has different inventory. The inventory you're going to have on your air conditioning is different from the inventory you're going to have on your bottle, uh, on your bottle, um, on your bottler. It's different from what you're going to have on your what, boiler. It is quite different from what you are going to have when you are maintaining a fleet of vehicles. And it's also different from what you are going to have when you are maintaining what we call um, heavy equipment, like all this, your moors, uh, your uh, vibrators, your uh, swamp, um, uh, swamp equipment. These are assets that have different kind of what, maintenance activity. And the kind of maintenance activity you are going to carry on there and this, their spare parts will determine their inventory. Then determine what will be included in the maintenance, what maintenance plan. These are what, 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 your key consider, uh, consideration. Then what are the process in include in maintenance planning? One, compile what we call asset register. Once you have understand your assets, and you carry out what you call facility condition assessment or asset assessment. You draw up what we call asset register. Your asset register is what gives you the detail of every detail required about that particular asset. Let's take a boiler for an example. When was the boiler bought? What is the make of the boiler? What is the model number? What is the serial number? What is the make? When was it bought? When was it installed? Then the make, what are the details of warranty that you have? What does your warranty cover? Does your warranty cover the element? Does your warranty cover the whole entire unit? Does your warranty cover some small items on that particular boiler? If no, you need to itemize inside your asset register the list of spear that are covered under warranty. So even tomorrow when you are not longer in that facility, whoever is the facility manager or the head of maintenance know that okay these are the details of warranty we have and not just only the detail of that warranty it's also you also include it also entails having the number of months or the number of years of warranty on those spare parts there are some spare parts that is the warranty elapsed after two months of procurement of that particular uh, equipment not there are some that it is after commissioning there are some warranty that last six months there are some that are one year five years ten years warranty or something you know, nowadays, now you see most of the air conditioning manufacturers are telling you two years pan Africa warranty. That means within Africa, anywhere you use that equipment, you have a two years warranty cover on what? The entire complete air conditioning. No, your warranty status or detail will tell you which particular part of that air conditioning they are referring to that you have two years warranty on it. So a facility manager needs to know and have a record of assets in order to choose a maintenance strategy. That's one. Be able to estimate what maintenance budget. So how much will that uh, as a uh, particular uh, part cost you? If that particular part costs you ten thousand euro, and you need to change that particular part twelve times in a year, or right, every month, that means your budget will be more or less like ten multiplied by twelve. So you are trying to like say, okay. Invariably, you have to budget like around 120,000 era for that um, spare parts replacement within a year. At the end of the day, you could have one or two variations. Possibly, maybe along the line, the price increases. But the bottom line is that you know that averagely, even if there are going to be a variation, it couldn't be more than 5 or 10% above your estimated what budget. These are what your assets right, the register can like assist you in the compile an asset register. The what is an asset register? We have already discussed this. So when we are dealing with uh, facility condition assessment, is a record of an organizational asset. It is a record that shows what an organization owns. That is what belongs to a particular company. Then it is a record that clearly identifies all owned assets. 
then it also help you in tracking your assets then you can easily conduct what we call asset um, asset audit easily then tag asset and scope which we already mentioned earlier on when you're talking about maintenance scope like i earlier mentioned that if i'm working in the as a facility manager or a plant manager with um, Julius Berger, my maintenance scope for most of my heavy equipment is different from even working as a facility manager in Coca-Cola. And this is different from when I'm working as a facility manager in a fast food or when I'm working as a facility manager in a, in a real estate. So each of the facilities that I'm maintaining will determine the scope of my maintenance. And at the same time, because in each of these facilities, I have different kind of assets. And this is different from if I'm a facility manager working in an IT industry. The kind of asset I'm maintaining is different from what a real estate facility manager is maintaining. So the asset at my disposal will determine the scope of my maintenance activity. It's a document that outlines the maintenance activity work to be performed under maintenance contract because if i'm giving out the contract to a third party to undo on my behalf i know what and what i need to like detail in that maintenance contract and that's the reason why most of the time um the scope of your maintenance is more or less like a detail SLA. if i'm giving my uh, cleaning services to a cleaning um, company I know what are going to be the scope of that cleaning. Then it also defines activity specific to a maintenance work contract. Then clearly define client expectations. So I know my minimum deliverable. So I know the minimum deliverable, the top party service providers should be able to give me. I know the minimum thing that I expect from them. So when they are performing below that minimum, then I draw up the line and call them to a round table. When it didn't improve, then I can say, okay, sorry. I'm laying you off. I'm getting another set of people to come and maintain this facility. Then, if they are performing above the deliverable, so that means that kind of a company are going beyond what they are going for milestone. They are going extra. They are taking extra step in making sure that they give me what is called satisfaction. It also helps me in smooth to smooth the functioning of what activity. It also helps to avoid what we call contract conflicts because. Before a contract is an agreement between two parties, the contract cannot be unilateral. It has to be what bilateral because it has to involve two parties agreeing together, either written or even verbal at times. It has to be what it has to be based on what an agreement. So once I draw up my maintenance scope or what I call SLE, I presented it to you, the top party. You go through it. What contradicts your own opinion or what you accept? You bring it out, we iron it out. At the end of everything, we agree on the terms. And once we both sign it, it becomes spiding. That becomes one another agreement. So that helps a lot to reduce what you call contract conflict between two parties. Then what are the components of maintenance scope? One, what is the objective of that scope? What do you want? What are your deliverables? What do you want? What are your expectations? What are the work procedure? What procedure means, if I'm working with Julius Berger, my work procedure is different from what when I'm working with the real estate. My work procedure is different from when I'm working with Cabri, where they make all this uh, um, chocolate and every other thing. So the work procedure differ in line with the type of facility we're actually maintaining. Then the maintenance schedule, is the kind of maintenance I have to carry out in the morning, is it the one that I have to carry out in the afternoon? Yeah, the one I have to carry out when the whole operation is completely done. When they have already complete the complete uh, when the machine has been shut down for the daily operation. So that means overnight I can do my task. So in that regards, I have I need to worry about overtimes or night allowance for my team during that period in time. Then that is where costs come into play. Then the timeline that it's required, it has to be part of the scope. Then service level agreement is part of scope, which I've earlier mentioned, then maintenance requirements. These are scope uh, components of 
scope of maintenance uh, planning. Conduct facility condition assessment. I wouldn't want to say much about it because we dealt with this in some of the past uh, trainings. The only way we, um, we have facility condition assessment, we know it's a process of carrying out analysis of an asset condition. And it's involved team of one or more experts scoping the word defects. Then what is the purpose of facility condition assessment, which we all know, to develop us, to itemize deficiency, it tells us what we needed to do, either to repair, to replace, or to what, upgrade, or, and at the same time, it also helps us in what, in forecasting, it's divine maintenance requirements, reduce the fad maintenance what, backlog. So these are more or less like what we gain when we conduct facility assessment. So review previous maintenance record. What we start to gain when we say we want to review previous maintenance record, that is, where that maintenance record is available. But when it is not available and we're taking this kind of facility for the first time, it is always better we draw up our own plan and we start maintaining our own record from there. And the advantage of doing a review of maintenance record is that you start to gain a lot of useful information for the maintenance plan because you know how many hours they've been using to do that kind of maintenance task before, the part that it is involved, the number of manpower and who are who are involved in conducting that uh, what, maintenance. So when you review the past record, these are kind of information you gain. It's also providing information on previous maintenance action. It helps with budget for future maintenance activities. You see how much they have spent the last time they did it. So by and large, because of price variation and price increase, you have you already have in mind what should be your likely cost in carrying out that maintenance task. It also gives you the history of the condition of the equipment. You know when the equipment has been bought, the number of maintenance tax that have been carried. So then what is the expected lifespan of that equipment? So it gives you a lot of general information about that equipment. Then it reveals the future potential problem. And so you know what are, there are more or less frequent with that particular equipment. Is it contactor issue, is it the um, particular kind of car has been having frequent flat tire. So you know exactly what are the frequent issue with that equipment. Then when you want to do your root cause analysis, you know exactly what you are dealing with. You wouldn't deal with issue that are just 1% and leave the one that is almost like 80% and start attending to 1%. If you are having an equipment that's giving you 80% defective product, I think that equipment require an urgency compared to an, uh, a machine that is giving you just only 1% defective product. So you'll be able to know what are the history of that equipment. Then what are the future potential of future breakdown that that equipment can have and how much it's going to cost, cost you. It's also, it reveal if that equipment is overly maintained, if it is under maintained or it is poorly maintained. When you look at the history, or the detail of how they maintain the record, you know that, sorry, this equipment is what? Poorly maintained. This equipment is what? It's fairly maintained. This equipment is what? Overly maintained. So you'll be able to like draw up or understand a lot of information about that equipment. Then, what are the preventive maintenance plan? How do you develop that? One, you need to decide on the assets to be maintained before you can start drawing up your preventive maintenance plan. What are the assets you want to maintain? For instance, in a training room, I need to perform a kind of a maintenance. What are the assets that I have in my training room? You have my, I have my projector, or possibly I have my television, I have my air condition, I have my fan, I have my chairs and table. Then what particular equipment? My chair is an asset, my uh, uh, standing fan is an asset, my air condition is an asset, my... Uh, projector is an asset. What are the kind of maintenance tax that I need to carry out on all those assets? And I have electric bulbs. My electric bulb can go under inventory. So you decide which of the assets you actually needed to maintain. And when you have decided the actual uh, asset you want to maintain, you can now sit down through the operation, uh, the manual of that equipment to draw up the maintenance plan. 
you need to evaluate the asset cost of repair and replacement. So you weigh between repair and replacement. Then determine frequency of performing the maintenance, level of priority of the asset. How key is that asset to the company? How key is that asset to production? How key is that asset to daily work? Consult equipment manufacturer manual, which I've earlier mentioned, uh, earlier mentioned. Determine maintenance tax from the manual. The manual of that equipment can help you drop a lot of work, maintenance tax to be performed on that equipment. Assign scale level and labor time for each task. Schedule maintenance tasks. Schedule equipment downtime. Create weekly plan for maintenance tasks. Create a plan for reactive maintenance needs. Train maintenance personnel on maintenance procedure using work method statement. Then put safety measure in place. Availability of safety data, LDC, job safety analysis, and permits to work. If you are actually working in a, an oil against company, there is no how you can rule out safety data sheet, job safety analysis, and permit to work. If you don't have permit to work, you don't put a spanner on a boat and not in an oil and gas industry. Even including most of production environment where they are very, very key in terms of facility maintenance or equipment maintenance. Your work permit is very, very key before you carry out a task. And work permit in most of those places are not signed only by maintenance manager alone. It is jointly signed by both maintenance manager and your own area you are going to sign is just to ensure your manpower is available. You have the inventory of what you needed to use. Then a safety manager must also sign because he must as ensure that all the safety requirements are in place. You have your tag out and tag in and tag out equipment and uh, materials are already in place. The operators are already being trained on the hazard of the job they are about to carry out, the maintenance activity they are about to carry out. And it is the job of the safety people to determine if the job is going to be carried out in a refine in a in, 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 uh, in a gas in a hazard uh, in an environment that has hazard or toxic gases or in a confined area. And that's the reason why you see most of the time when you are performing a kind of maintenance activity in a confined area, you see you have a kind of a chain at the back that has been tied. So outside, somebody within one some period of time have to like draw up that line. Then you inside, you draw up the line back to ensure that you are alive. And there are signs you need to like put in place when you are running into a, a little challenges inside. And that's the reason why you see most of the fast food or most of companies that are dealing with cold rooms. Or if you are working in all this um, uh, Nigerian building where they produce um, beer, where they have what we call blast freezer. Because their kind of freezer they use is called, they use ammonia gas to charge their freezers. And this is a freezer that can give you cold bomb. So there are safety rules. When you are going inside the freezer, there is a process of entering, there is a process of coming out. And when you are inside the freezer and the door is locked, there are illuminations that show you where the entrance is. And when you are trying to open the door to my sky, that the dozen door doesn't open, there is a safety bed that you press that alarm the people outside to tell them that, sorry, I need to come out, but the door is not opening. So these are kind of thing that it's involved. So before you go into that kind of an environment to perform a maintenance task, a job permit has to be signed. If you don't have that job permit, you can't go. Then it is now the function of the operation manager to also sign the job permit, your permit to work, by and after he has already ensured that he can easily show that the equipment for the world, so ever tax you guys want to perform on it. So these are what is very, very key when you want to draw up your normal preventive maintenance. So it is all depend on facility wise. Just like if I need to do missing work in my real estate, and this requires me setting up scaffolding. So when I want to set up the scaffolding, what are the tasks it involved? Do I need to get all the necessary state government approval? Do I need to get safety approval? Do I need to go to legal state safety commission to get approval or the state commission approve, uh, uh, safety for approval? It's all about missing. What do I? What are the safety 
things that I need to put in place. So it is until when everything has already been put in place that I can now ensure that, okay, I can carry out what I call my normal preventive maintenance work activity. Then establishing, how do I establish process of tracking my maintenance activity? When I develop a maintenance activity tracking system, one, to provide needed information for how do I schedule my labor? How do I get my material that are required? How do I ensure that the cost of financing that maintenance activity is available? The money is available then too, which is very, very critical. Even if the money is available, material is available, labor is available. When tools is not available, it becomes very, very critical to perform that kind of maintenance activity. So labor, material, cost, and tools are very, very key. An example of such system is what we call computerized maintenance management system, CMMS. And like I rightly mentioned when we were dealing with facility condition assessment, I told you that CMMS is just like a software under what we call computer-aided facility management. So the CMMS is more or less like the model. Uh, uh, CAFM is the mother, why CMMS is more or less like son and daughter being born to one single mother. So CMMS look at the, uh, 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 at the angle of operational maintenance of an asset. Why computer-aided facility maintenance look at the entire facility as a whole. Computerized record and reporting records and reporting record and record and report maintenance activity so when you perform a maintenance activity you record it under your cmms so when that maintenance tax is already due for another routine maintenance your cmms will generate and send the information to the right tax to the right person that is going to carry out the task so most of this production industry you see the cmms is being done in such a way that every tax has an assigned tax performer so the cmm is also configured in such a way that the information goes directly to the table of whoever is going to perform that task it's just like when you are monitoring your inventory the inventory information goes to both the maintenance or the plant manager and at the same time the storekeeper and at the same time possibly at times the finance personnel so the, the finance pass, uh, department knows that they needed to spend money on some certain parts because the certain part is required by maintenance people. Then supply chain team also have an information about that because they know that the particular part that maintenance people are using to carry out maintenance activities is already going down. So at their end, they know what and what to do. They know, the, they have the detail of that part. They know who is the particular vendor supplying them that part. Immediately, they consult that past supplier to get that part ready before maintenance will perform that, carry out that maintenance activity. So it also helps you to manage your maintenance work request effectively and efficiently. How do you generate your maintenance work request? It's all depend on company wise. There are some companies that, okay, the end user or possibly the tenant in the real estate generate a request. The air conditioning in my room is leaking water. So it generates a request. The request is being taken by maintenance technician. The maintenance technician take it and minute on it, send it to the facility supervisor. From facility supervisor, it goes towards the facility manager. Then when it is a little amount of money, when it involves your operation expenses, which is, is all depend on company wise, there are some certain company that if it is 10,000 error, it has an approval limit, 50,000 error approval limit, another approval limit, 100,000 error and approval limit. And when it's come to maybe 1 million error above, it has an approval limit as well. 4 million error above, it gets an approval limit. So if it is operation expenses, if it is just a matter of changing some plumbing fitting or whatever within the air conditioning uh, system, the technician can write the amount of money it's going to take to buy maybe possibly capacitor for that air conditioning. The supervisor sign and ensure that, okay, sorry, it is actually what 
capacitor that is the air conditioning is having problem with, then it passes it down to the facility manager. If it is within the scope of the facility manager, what happens is that the facility manager signed that request and asked the technician to go ahead and do what and perform that task. But when it goes beyond what the supervisor or the facility manager can approve, possibly it might require the signature of the facility manager and the accountant. Or when it's, it's up to five million and above, it might up, need to get to up to director's level. So, but the bottom line is that your work order or work request is open until when that task is completely completed. That's when you can close that work order. There are some certain work order you can open that you might not be able to close because of availability of fund to perform that work request. So, but your computerized uh, computer uh, computerized um, aided um, maintenance system help you to monitor your work order. So you know what are the work order that are still open. You know the one that has already been closed. So the one that are already open, that are still open, you'll be able to determine why is it still open, why has it not been done. Then you'll be able to prioritize your maintenance work. You know which one is critical, which one is urgent, which one you can put on hold. Then you can manage your resources. You can benchmark your SLA, service level agreement, and your KPI, that is key performance indicator. Then your maintenance task requirement, track work status. If it has been done, it's still pending, or it is halfway done, 90% done, or other percent done. Analyze record. You can easily analyze your recorded maintenance data. You can produce maintenance reports. You can control maintenance costs. It also helps you to generate, manage, uh, to manage your report and your historical data. These are what you gain when you maintain a good reporting computerized maintenance detail. Maintenance checklist. Why do you draw up a maintenance checklist? Either during planning, uh, during execution, and after you have already performed your maintenance task. One, it enables facility manager to maximize what we call efficiency. So before you step into performing a task, you know what is available and what is not available. Then it also helps you to get all maintenance tasks done. So you don't have anything left behind. So if I am performing a routine maintenance on my fleet, I know I need to conduct, I have my checklist. What and what do I need to do? There is a checklist when I want to check the complete wheel system of the car. There is a checklist when I want to conduct a check on the braking system. I have a checklist that I use to assess the fleet or the car when after they have already performed the necessary maintenance task on them. Then I have another test uh, checklist before the car or the bus embark on what we call a travel. So what type of checklist do I need to have? I check, does the car have an extra tire? Fine, it has, good. I tick that one. Does the car has a jack? Yes, it's us. Good, I think. Does the car has what you call sea caution? So these are what I can have in my work checklist. Then it also helps you to get all maintenance tasks done, which I've, I've already uh, expanded on. Then it's the start starting point for routine maintenance. Where do I start from? Start from shutting down the equipment. As the equipment be shut down, yes. Tag in, tag out, put in place, yes. Resources available, yes, and all those stuff. So you know where to start and when to close that maintenance task. It is used to inspect facility in logical sequence. It provides detailed list. Of... Security. Hello. It provides detail of detailed list of facility different or past. It also aids facility manager during MBWA. Your MBWA is called management by wandering around or management by walking around mbwa management or maintenance by walking around or wandering around is a kind of maintenance you carry out as a plant manager as a facility manager when a particular maintenance task is ongoing to check on the team to check on the status of that work and to check on the status of the equipment that is being that the repair work is being carried out. It's not a detailed kind of um, work uh, work around. It's just like 
you walk and check one or two things and go back. It's also, checklist also, it indicates the frequency of the maintenance activity. The item on the maintenance checklist will vary depending on the machine strategy being adopted. So your checklist in a uh, real estate environment is different from a factory. And even if you are maintaining two factory, a bread factory will have a different checklist compared to a bottle production factory or pure water production factory. So a preventive maintenance checklist will vary from a predictive maintenance checklist. The reason being that the former involved taking equipment out for a service for uh, out of service for maintenance so that a larger problem does not occur in the future. The latter inform the monitor of equipment to determine when maintenance will be necessary. So your predictive and your preventive are quite different from each other. During your preventive, you can you can completely it's to require you to completely shut down. But predictive uh, maintenance, you don't need to shut, shut down because what you are actually checking is the words. You are only monitoring the performance of the equipment, most especially when you are monitoring what we call alignment of your conveyor belt. So you don't need to shut down the, the complete uh, production line. You only need to ensure that, okay, the conveyor belt is aligned. It does it align. It's not aligned. Okay, what do we need to do? So monitoring and evaluation. When you are carrying out maintenance uh, activity, you need to monitor. And why do you need to monitor? Monitoring is a, is a tool that ensure maintenance are executed as well as planned. So you monitor and ensure that okay, where they supposed to lose boat first. They don't start by carrying out sledge armor to hit that boat. It is used to assess maintenance actions effectively. Does that maintenance action action perform effectively? Yes or no? Then what are the things that your monitoring involved? It also provides feedback on maintenance activities that are in progress. It identifies maintenance problems. So you know area where the staff are just sitting down, claiming that they are actually conducting maintenance, uh, preventing maintenance, and they are just gisting. Um, possibly at times, when you monitor, you might eventually realize that possibly, instead of assigning three manpower, maybe what you actually need is just only two manpower for that kind of maintenance task. Then, it also helps you to take corrective action on the identified what problem. Then when you evaluate, evaluation address the maintenance plan strength and weakness. So when you conduct a maintenance plan, you know, is this maintenance plan actually solving the maintenance problem that you have? Or is it actually giving the equipment the required maintenance activity? Then if it is not, where are, where are the area of weakness? So that you can quickly remedify it before the next maintenance task is being performed. Then it also help you to assess and identify maintenance work problem. It also help you to assess the effectiveness of a maintenance activity. So it's not that you are just performing maintenance. There are some certain maintenance. You come to realize that does this maintenance activ uh, activity actually required on this particular equipment? Okay, is this something that is actually required for every month or this is something that can perform maybe twice in a month to improve. Just like when you are running your generator in a dusty environment, you know that steam washing of your radiator is a constant thing that you need to perform compared to when you are running it in an area that is less free of the dust. Then evaluation helps you to review your maintenance record. It also helps you to set up method of corrective work action. These are what you gain when you monitor and you evaluate your maintenance activity very, very well. So monitoring and eva uh, evaluation is a process of monitoring and evaluation. It, it involves stakeholder identification. If you are working in a factory, who are your stakeholder? Your stakeholder are your operator because these are people who dine and wine with the equipment on a daily basis. Then what are the evaluation questions? You so when you are trying to like evaluate your maintenance tax you have already performed, who are the people that is going to give you information? What are the questions you are trying to ask from them? Then allocation of your resources, timeline for the monitoring and evaluation of what activity. Establish the scope of evaluation. It involves clarifying what should be monitored and evaluated. 
So it's not every maintenance tag that you monitor and evaluate, but the one that are very, very critical that you need, you know, is going to have a positive impact if you can improve on that maintenance task. Then when you are setting up monitoring and evaluation plan, what form of plan? One, establish method for data collection and analysis. So you need to establish how do you want to get your um, data that you want to evaluate and you want to analyze. Stakeholder involvement, like I told you, if you are working in a factory, who are your stakeholder? Your operators, develop a communication process. Who are you communicating with? Your operators, establish what will be communicated. What are you asking? What are the questions you are asking them as per that equipment? Okay, how often do you normally have a derail bottle on this cover bed? How often do you have gear issue? How often do you have wears and tear coming into products? So your operators can help you generate a lot of what answer to this question. Then set up reporting line. So when there are issues within the factory or there are issues within the estate, who are they reporting to? Who is the first responder? Who is the first person that must receive that information when there is an issue? So is it the head of facility or is it the facility manager or so, facility supervisor? So you need to set up reporting line. This is what you need to put in place in evaluating your work, evaluating and monitoring your work, your maintenance uh, activities. So we're going for a short break. This is already five o'clock. We're back by five twelve or five thirteen. So we have like seven minutes for the short break. So when we come back, we we'll start from maintenance record. Thank you very much. So let's go for a short break now. History card. So uh, that's the reason why in safety, even when an accident doesn't occur that you call near miss, you still have to what do what? You still have to record it as far as safety is concerned. So that's the same way maintenance. Keeping an adequate log of maintenance activity is considered good business practice. Records are particularly useful in maintaining in maintenance management because one, it ensures equipment are kept in good condition. Then two, it offers a way to manage and track repair and preventive upkeep expenses. So you'll be able to track all the repair and maintenance expenses you have been spending on that particular asset. Then when you want to make a request for a replacement in terms of asset with your equipment record, you can easily use that one to justify the reason why you are requesting for replacement because when the cost of maintenance is equivalent to the cost of replacing that equipment, it is always better to get that equipment replaced because a new equipment will serve you better compared to continuous repair. Then, record, how do you manage your maintenance record? The professional practice of managing the record of an organization through one, one, throughout their life cycle. Then two, from the time they are created to their eventually disposal, that is record management. Right from the day one, when the equipment is commissioned and is being put to use, you maintain a very and good quality record till the expiration of the lifespan of that particular equipment and when it is completely what, disposed of. Uh, record management involves identifying, classifying, storing, securing, retrieving, tracking, destroying, or permanently preserving the record. So when you dispose of an equipment, some certain people or some certain company, they don't destroy the information about that equipment. Otherwise, they even had to, they won't have to it. So that since it is likely equipment, You can see what are the repair and maintenance or likely for that have been the make of that equipment is different. If the make are still the same thing. Okay. So as soon as the equipment are the same thing, the same make, then definitely you can still maintain it the same. You can still keep the record of the previous equipment as that we also help you at the same time. So your maintenance record management is very, very key because 
this saves you a lot of thing as far as maintenance is concerned. And it also provides you a lot of vital information to make a positive decision on asset replacement or equipment replacement. Why do you keep maintenance record? A maintenance record can be invaluable in assisting them with a machine or a vehicle. Good record helps you to ensure that a piece of equipment is performing in line with any manufacturer's warranty. Then it also helps you to track when a piece of equipment needs to undergo preventive maintenance. These are all advantage of keeping a good maintenance record. The purpose of maintenance record, keeping machine, keeping machinery in a good working order is one of the best way to protect it as an investment. And documenting the care can make the equipment more desirable if it is ever sold, since there is a proof that it was properly serviced. Then throughout record, total record can also be a useful, a buffer against liability. If a company gets sued in relation to a 40 piece of equipment, detailed record can be essential in supporting the company's case and showing that there, is, there was due diligence. Most especially when you have warranty on your particular equipment, you know, it is only when you want to claim the warranty that you start having a lot of challenges with what the equipment supplier or the manufacturer, because they might tell you that, sorry, you are not putting a good maintenance activities in place, but your record, your history, your information management are something that you can like pull out to help you build a case around your claim that story. This equipment is, is maintained in line with manufacturer specification. So these are all what you can start to gain when you have a good maintenance record management system in place in your facility. The benefit of performing maintenance and keeping record. One, preventing expensive repair. Two, it's established individualized maintenance program. Three, increase ease of warranty claim. It is easier for you to claim warranty because you know what is actually covered under warranty and the number of months is actually covered under warranty. They increase safety of, for the operators. It increases longevity through accountability. It also identifies trend across mix, model, or component. Better understanding of your asset. These are what you stand to gain when you keep a good maintenance record. And when you perform a good maintenance. Then we have what we call mean time between failure, MTBF. MTBF is called mean time between failure. Your mean time between failure is the ratio of the number of hours of operation of that equipment or that asset divided by the number of breakdown. I come again. Your mean time between failure, MTBF, your mean time between failure is the ratio of the number of hour of operation of a particular equipment divided by the number of breakdown of that equipment. For instance, let me give an example. If you are in a fleet industry where you maintain cars and traveling vehicles and everything, if a vehicle run 30,000 kilometers within a year. Oh, I can't hear you, sir. Okay, please check your internet. Can you hear me now? I can't hear you. Can you hear me now, please? Okay, yes. Okay. Yes. So as I was saying, if you are working in uh, a facility where you maintain fleets of, fleet of car, if you have a particular car that run from January 1st to 31st of December, and it ran 30,000 kilometers, and that particular car only breaks down three times within that year. So your main time between failure becomes that 30,000 divided by three. That gives you 10,000. So your mean time between failure is 10,000. For that particular car, the mean time between failure is what? Is 10,000 kilometers before. That means that vehicle is running 10,000 kilometers before it can break down averagely. So, and you use your mean time between failure to determine the reliability of a particular asset or equipment. If you have another car, they are around 30,000 kilometers, and that same car breaks down for 1,000 or let's say 1,000 times within that 
year. So you should know that 30,000 divided by 1,000 give you what, 3,000. So that means at every 3,000 kilometer, that car or that vehicle we definitely what breaks down. So if you if you compare the two, which one is more reliable? You know that the vehicle that is running 10,000 kilometers before it breaks down is far, far more reliable than the one that breaks down at every 1,000 kilometers. This is where your maintenance record can easily assist you to determine how a particular asset is reliable or a particular vehicle is what reliable. So you'll be able to draw what we call reliability of that particular asset. So and also, these are mean time, the predicted last time between the inherent failure of a system during what operation. Just like what was the running hour before the first breakdown of your generator? The running hour is 2000. What was the next running hour before the next breakdown? The running hour is, um, let's assume that the running hour is 3000. The generator breaks down. Then it was repaired. I started back to uh, put back to operation. And then it now breaks down again at 5,000 running hour. That means the mean time between the failure is just 2,000 hour. The first one occurred at 3,000 hour, while the second one occurred at what? Uh, 5,000 hour. So the mean time between the two failure is what? <clears throat> just 2,000 hour. So your mean time between failure help you to determine how reliable your asset is. Or how reliable your equipment is. So when the equipment is no longer reliable, that means the equipment is definitely calling for what what we call a replacement. So it describes the expected time between two failure for a repairable system. Can be calculated as the average time between failure with system. Assume the failed system is immediately repaired. Is a measure of how reliable a system is, which I've already told you that you can use your empty PF to determine how reliable your asset is. Verifying facility inventory. When you have, like, what are your inventory? Every facility has its inventory. It all depends on the type of facility you are maintaining. Set standard for facility inventory. Your CMMS, which is computer, my computer management maintenance system, help to effectively control the supply and flow of parts and equipment. Maintenance department can set standard for inventory using CMS. Even most of us, we practice this in our various facilities. Most especially in a facility where you have diesel supply. So you know that it's a standard. Once your diesel level is getting to like possibly 2,000 liter, 1,000 liter, you started raising alarm that I'm running out of diesel. You don't wait until when the diesel finally exhausted before you start making reordering. Or in a facility where your major backbone is gas. So once you know your daily gas consumption, so once you know you are running out of gas, and you know the only gas you have available can only take you for a production of one week, you started raising what? Alarm. And that started giving you a kind of alarm. So when you are using CMMS, the kind, that kind of information goes to the what? Supply chain department. So when the level of gas is around one month, that can take you for a month, possibly, the flash can be on green. When you have two weeks to go, it can be on amber. Then when you have a week to go, it shows red. So every supply chain department knows that when you, they are already on amber, they need to start making reordering. Then two, a major aspect of effective, is a major aspect of effectively controlling parts and equipment supply and setting minimum record level. So you don't just tie down capital in the name of keeping inventory. You know which particular part is being consumed regularly. You know one that is just being consumed once in a year. So the one that is being consumed once in a year, you only order them when the maintenance activities is about to be carried out so that you don't just tie down money. Setting minimum reorder level ensure each inventory item is restocked before it is exhausted. Inventory documentation. Documenting inventory usage is of utmost importance. Documentation is common, common, uh, commonly overlooked. And the only time it seems to be needed is when things go wrong, which is very, very bad. It's a very, very bad habit. Documentation enables a facility manager to one, know which item is available in the store, know when to restore, 
no items which are frequently or infrequently used. So the ones that are infrequently used, you only order for them when the need arises or when they are about to. If you have a maintenance tax to perform, maybe possibly next month or in two weeks time, and you know that your ordering period, you can get that particular part supply within a week. So you can start making your order when it's about a week to perform that, about two weeks to perform that particular maintenance activity. Inventory reporting. When you, inventory reporting is used to report inventory level and movement in facility management store or in a, in a plant store. The three categories of inventory reports are one, inventory status report. Review the status of the inventory by location and time and period. Then two, inventory analysis report. Review the profitability, turnover, and demand for the inventory. Like what I earlier said that you don't need to tie down capital. You only make ordering for what is required and when it is required. Integri inventory integrity report. Review discrepancies between item information and accounting information. So these are the type of inventory reporting you can be using in facility management. Records should be documented. What type of work was carried out in terms of maintenance activity? When was it performed? Who performed the maintenance activity? When any inspection or, or equipment testing takes place, the record should reflect whether the inspection or testing follow manufacturer guidelines and commonly or and company or protein procedure. This is very, very key. Maintenance record procedure. One, make an inventory of all equipment, including include any item that need to be periodically inspected or repaired. Assign a tracking number for each item. Decide on keeping record manually or automatically. You can keep your record manually or you can keep it automatically. So, but when you are using CMMS, your record has to be what? Automatically. Keep a backup copy, whether manual or automatic, so that you don't lose information. Update record whenever work is what performed. When you uh, whenever you perform any maintenance task, you need to update your maintenance record, excuse me, it's very, very So filing or keeping, how do you keep your record? A good filing system permits easy economy and efficient organization, maintenance and protection of documents. So even when you need certain information, you know which particular file or which particular folder or which particular shelf you need to go within the office to get your information. Reflect the function of the office itself. Should have a structured numeric or alpha numeric referencing system. So you can have a kind of a file for all the complete air conditioning system in the whole facility. Get another file for all the equipment in the whole facility. Get another file which is detailing on building. Get another file that is detailing on all the other assets of the company. So you can categorize assets. In terms of maybe IT, you can have a folder for IT related assets, power related assets, then uh, plumbing related assets, electrical related assets. So you can categorize them, it all depends. Then all documents on a file should bear the file reference number. File title should clearly identify file content. The file title should never be generic, such as miscellaneous. So, so that when you are saying miscellaneous, that means definitely you cannot ascertain what and what are inside that file. But when you have a heading for each of the file, when you are looking for anything related to power, like as an example, you know which particular file you need to go to. So when you are talking about power, you need to go to air conditioning file to check for information as regarding power. File cover should be printed to permit the title. Reference date of opening and closing of the file. Documents should be filed in reverse order. A new file should be opened in a new subject envelope, rendering the original file title inaccurate. Files should be closed when the business to which they are related has been completed. These are guidelines for your maintenance record filing. If you are actually using a manual and you want to maintain both manual and automatic, so at the back end, the manual end, you have what you call filing. Retaining record. 
the record retention schedule, name the content and the purpose of each of the record series, prescribe the necessary retention period. The retention period will range from immediate destruction or destruction after a period of time to permit to permanent retention. So like if you are using CMMS, all the work order that you have used, let's assume that, okay, the work order you have used in 2015, in order to free some space, you know that 2015, you've already closed all the work in 2015. So you can now say, okay, every record of five years ago can be terminated. So you can, you can delete off 2015. So that means you maintain 2016 up to 2021. By the time you get to 2022, you delete off all 2016 records. By the time you get to 2023, you delete off 2017 records. So you know that you are maintaining a record of at least a span of six years every year or five years every year. So it involves specifying the length of time that that record must be what maintained. So it could be five years, it could be two years, it could be one year. There are some company that when they do their accounting audit for like two, four, five years, after, after three years, the three years ago accounting record is being disposed of while they maintain the current accounting year. So those are all about record retention. Work at order capturing and tracking. I've explained what work order means to us the other time. So some communities call work order, some communities call um, work request. So what is work order management? It involves creating, qualifying, dispatching, and executing work requests for off-site work called work order. So you can call it work order or work request. You create the work request, you qualify it. Is it power related? Is it plumbing related? Is it mechanical related? If it is plumbing related, you know the actual place that that work request should go to. It should go to your plumber. Then who is executing that work request? It's your plumber. So the step and function of the work order life cycle work together to ensure that site issues are resolved in the most efficient manner possible. Creating a work order. This involves gathering the initial information about the work that needs to be done. The initial, the initiator of the work order, the initiator of the work order, one, determine the nature of the problem. Two, provide all necessary information needed for the work order task. For instance, I need to change the capacitor on an air condition. What is the size of the air uh, capacitor? How much is the capacitor? What is the UF? Those are certain, or possibly I need to change a contactor on a covier rolling machine. What is the size of the contactor? What is the make of the contactor? Is it a three pole contactor or a four pole contactor? What is the current rating? So, those are the technical information that must be provided. So, provide all necessary information needed for the work order. Identify material and labor required for the work order. Create the tasks necessary to complete the work order. Assign work order to whoever is going to be the task performer. Follow up with the work assignment till the work is completely closed. So scheduling work activity. When the work order is being approved, it is the next thing is that you now schedule when and how to perform the work order to carry out the maintenance work. Now, define the work order activity, the work, the, define the schedule of activity, sequence of activity, Estimate the resources needed for the activity. Estimating the duration of each of the activity. Schedule development. Monitor and control what the schedule. So that's why you see in some facilities, some facilities in some company, they have a maintenance planner and they have a schedule planner as well. Uh, so these two people do the job separately. Maintenance planner plan how to do the work. And the job of the scheduler is to sit down and schedule how the work is going to be done. So when the job has already been scheduled, the task has already been scheduled to carry out, okay, we've already agreed we are going to, with operation, we are going to carry the work over, carry out the maintenance work overnight when the factory is completely shut down. So now, who are the personnel that are going to be involved in carrying out that maintenance task? This involves tracking labor resources, and assigning job to the personnel. Most of the factory, if you're working as a facility manager in factory, the, how you are able to control your manpower cost could be part of your KPI. 
So that's why you need to be very, very, you need to understand the nature of the maintenance work you want to carry it out and how many labor will you require to carry out that maintenance task. Keeping a record for all maintenance personnel, they are craft or trade category. So who is a plumber? Who is a mechanical guy? Who is a welder? Who is a uh, furniture guy? Who is a carpenter? Who is a mason? So you need to understand the craft or the trade category that each of your personnel possesses. Keeping track of labor rates in order to capture and track true labor costs against any equipment. Tracking of skill level and qualification for each resource to help you in planning and scheduling your work, your maintenance activity. So when you have already carried out your maintenance activity, the next thing is that record and tracking material. This involves tracking items being moved in or out of inventory from one location to another. Tracking of stocked, non-stocked, and special order item. Tracking location of item, item cost information, and the substitute or alternative item. Most especially you cannot get the actual spare part. You can use an alternative. Most if you are working in all this factory where you change a lot of bearing, at times the bearing that come with a particular agreement, you might not get the actual one. But there are some other alternative ones that will still serve the same purpose. Record tracking, recording and tracking of tools. Your tools is a major backbone of your maintenance activity. When you don't have your tools in place or your tools are being worn out and you don't replace them as I went to you, is a very, very critical movement of your tool. Who did you assign your tools to? How is the person maintaining that tool? So you know the kind of tool that you assign to an electrical guy, the tool you assign to an RNA guy, the tool you assign to a plumber, the tool you assign to a welder, the tool, and they must keep a good track record of those two other Otherwise, you might eventually keep wasting money on replacement of tools. Tracking the use and movement of tools, tracking the condition of the tools for repair or replacement purpose. There are some certain tools that you may need to even carry out maintenance activities. While work planner to see what tools are in stock and assign tools to various work categories to reduce research effort by techniques and techniques initial working in the field. So, and that also helps you to use the right tools for the right repair or the right uh, maintenance activity. When you are recording, uh, recording costs, expenses relating to labor and parts can also be documented in order to assist with what? Future budget forecasting. When you are trying to draw up your budget for the next calendar year, you can pull out your equipment history card gather a lot of information in terms of cost you have expended that year on that particular equipment. So you know that coming year, this is the amount of money you are going to spend on that particular equipment. You can forecast and you can use that one to prepare your budget for the next calendar year. Work order service, work order service request approval. Approving work order. A work order begin with the service request. It starts from either your uh, tradesman or your technician, your technical team. This service can be preventive or corrective maintenance or any type of facility needed. When a service request is received, the facility manager raises a work order. For the work order to the requesting party or client for approval, the client either approve or reject or cancel the work request because the client is actually the one paying for that repair work. So you can decide that, okay, put it on hold. Okay, let's see what we can do. But at times, the client generates the work order and send to maintenance or facility manager to execute. Approving a work order means that it has been reviewed and it is ready to be qualified for task creation or assignment. So once the work order is approved, that means the ta task to be carried out or the maintenance activity to be done has already been approved. So it's more or less like you get a go ahead 
to carry out a maintenance activity or to embark on a maintenance repair. That takes us to the end of the slide. We have our assessment and what we have to do is to get all our assessment done and submit through the appropriate quota. So I'll start welcoming questions one after the other, please. Kindly indicate by raising up your hand if you have any question in the course of this course. Mr. Aweta Vic, I can see your hand. I'm taking you as the first person, but I'm coming. Chaja, Patrice. Mr. Aweta Vic, I've seen you. Then please. Okay. Okay. I can only see Mr. Aweta Vic hand up. Okay, I have Mr. Chaos. Mr. Chaos. Yes, sir. Okay, I see you raise up your hand before. Okay, sir. Can I ask my question? No, just hold on. You'll be the second person. Mr. Wet, I think, is the first person. Mr. Chaos, you'll be the second person. Let me see if others are still raising their hand. Okay. Mr. Francis, you'll be the third person. I have Mr. Aware, Mr. Francis. Mr. Christian, you'll be the fourth person. So I have one to four now. Okay. Mr. Awet Afik, can you please go ahead and ask your question, please? Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Yeah. Afik. Yes, I have two questions. And the first question, which goes, when you are talking about asset and inventory, I know we've already discussed asset and inventory before. But yes, I'm of course. Confused. You mentioned it today that anything that has to do with lightning, they are, are inventory, such as bulbs and so on. But you know that there are some lights, especially these uh, LED flood lights made by Philips and other brands that cost about one pair, cost about 250,000 naira. And it lasts like five or six years. So can we call that asset or inventory? Anything that can last to beyond one year becomes more like an asset. Now we deal, we deal with that. Okay. okay your you inventory are more or less like your consumable, something which you consume within a span of one year. One month, two months. Okay, and then that, thanks for that. Then the second question is, when we were talking about the mean time between failures, MTBF. So you, you, you were- It's mean, mean the time is, between failure. M between failures, yes, MTBF, yes. 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 Before, uh, you were talking about the formula that number of hours of operation uh, to ratio to number of breakups. Let's assume yes. now, uh, we, when you make uh, you made mention of a vehicle for in particular. Let's assume yes, that course. that vehicle didn't, there's nothing like breakdown. It's just like a minor, like maybe the shock absorber is gone, or maybe the uh, ball and joint, something is wrong with it. But that doesn't still mean the vehicle won't move. Will we, should, do we consider that fact into that number of breakup, or when the vehicle is totally down, that it can't move? That is what we can term as breakup. When you when, when you when you take your vehicle for either a minor or a major repair work, as at that time the vehicle is idle, it's not actually performing any tax. Yes or no? Hello, Mr. Yeah, I can't get it there, sir. Okay, so what I'm saying is that when you take your vehicle, what do you call downtime? Your downtime is when your equipment is not performing the function it is being designed for. Okay, yes, yes, that's true. So when you take your car for either the placement of the brake or you are changing one or two spare on it, for that period in time, that equipment is actually not working. Yes or no? Yes, it is not working. So that is more or less like a downtime. So the number of downtime you have divided by the number of hours you use to operate that particular equipment tells you your mean time between failure. Okay, because the reason really why you take that car for a kind of replacement of that as uh, that particular part is because 
you are actually trying to prevent sports total breakdown okay okay that's true that means during so the that, that period in time, time. You have what what is it i said during the routine servicing yes. that can also be called downtime it's a downtime okay 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 it's a downtime but see you better understand it if you are coming from a factory angle okay because from a factory angle you actually shut down so even ordinary one single pin to replace it on a particular equipment within the factory you have to shut down as small as a breaker single pole breaker is in a distribution fuse board if you want to replace it safety demand that you shut down that the whole entire db of course it's a downtime okay. Okay. okay it's a downtime because that period in time that distribution fuse board is of no use and every okay. equipment that is connected to that power point okay. are completely idle within that period they can't work okay i get it even if okay, we have to change one single plug like this, it's down. It's our downtime. But it's another, thing, another fact, yeah, another another thing I'm about to ask is, you know, do, there are some times when we are when please, we are somebody, is, please, who is speaking there? Please kindly mute yourself, please. There's a background noise. Okay, Mister Tafi, go ahead, sir. What I'm saying is there are sometimes when. Uh, when there, there is no operations, yeah, maybe yeah. during closing hour, and maybe that during closing hour, maybe between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m., which is our uh, closing hour, off hour, can when we do that repair that time, can we still time it as that same? Uh, uh, that that is time? Time. The advantage you have at that period in time is because you have peak and off peak period. That doesn't mean that your equipment is down. No. What you show down is operation, not equipment. Okay. So, okay. Because so that period in time, it. if by 2 a.m. in the morning you put on the equipment, they will still function. Right or wrong? Right, right. So it is not that the equipment is down. What is down okay. during that period is operation. operation. So that kind of operation, you have peak period and off. <laughs> You have operation hour and non-operation hour. But that is different from a factory where you run 24 hours. Okay, I get that clear enough. So, so I hope that answers your question, Mr. Very well, very well. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm satisfied okay. now. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Francis, please go ahead. Please, yes, sir. Good evening, Mr. Francis. Good evening, sir. I can hear you clearly, Mr. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, please, so please um, all right. So I please I want you to give me the um the formula for the MTBF again. You said is the ratio is the ratio of total number of hour you use the equipment divided by the number of breakdown within that hour. Number of hour. Equipment is used. Divided by the number of bricks are within that power. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So my second question. Okay, um, sir. It's uh, concerning this tagging, the tagging and tag out. Okay. Can we can we say are you is that what you meant by tagging and tag out that um, a particular asset or equipment needs to be repaired and we place a barricade around it? Does that mean a tagging a tag in and tag out until when the put, equipment is when, fully fixed? When, when you put a barricade, it's more like you're tag, you're tagging it. That means a restricted area. Nobody comes to that place. Okay. Yes, Abi. Okay, so it's possibly, just the word you know, to say tag in and tag out. Yes, when you are doing your floor cleaning and the floor is wet. Yes, I was going to give that sign. example. Yes. Yeah, that wet floor, yes, right? Yes. That means nobody passes yes, that place yes. except people who are doing the cleaning. 
Okay. Right. Until those so uh, like, signs are removed, what? then you exactly, have to have exactly, exactly, exactly. So if okay, you so are you watching the factory, every... most especially if you are an electrical person or a mechanical person, when you want to perform yes. any tax on electrical, there are some factory that every of their technician has their own part load. So if I need to work on the electrical oh machine, God. I put tag in there and I lock it with my own part lock. So that nobody can go there to go and plug that equipment while I'm performing the repair work. So when okay. I complete it and I ascertain that everything is okay, I will use my own padlock to unlock and replug the equipment back for operation. Okay. Got it. Thank you, sir. Okay, you're welcome. So, Mr. Christian. Uh, yeah. Uh, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Christian. Yes, uh, I just have a question. Uh, it's about the maintenance um, report. I'm oh, sorry, maintenance um, register. Register, so okay. I, yeah, I just want to you know, hmm? confirm something on, on that because... Uh, maintenance register or asset register? Main, asset register, rather. Sorry. Okay, okay. Yeah, so I have... Uh, like when I actually assumed a, a position in this uh, place where I'm currently working, uh, okay, I noticed sir. that there's been no asset uh, registered there. So okay. most of the uh, equipment are not registered. So I came up with uh, my own register. And okay. uh, what I noticed that some certain things are not really, uh, like they're not really aligned to my own uh, templates. So I don't know if there's actually a standardized template for asset register, or probably we just have to devise or design our own templates. No, I, I, I said you are using a software where you have details of information you enter or you program into that software. But if you are using a manual type of um, asset register, there's no any specific kind of uh, template for it. The only thing your asset register should maintain is the name of the equipment, the make of the equipment, the serial number, the model number. You might be private to have the date of commissioning, but if in case you don't have, ensure you record every other detailed information you have about that equipment. It helps you a lot. Okay. Then you so, can now have a physical one that's more or less like you can get a higher education or all this hardcover notebook, have the detail list there, then transfer it into Excel then everybody can have a copy of that exam so you know the detail of all assets that the company has. So that is the only thing I can think you can do. But if you are using a software kind of a thing, you pick all the information, send it to your software, and update it on time, uh, uh, at time to time when you, are, when you conduct your assets. OK, I guess that's where the uh, computerized uh, maintenance uh, management uh, uh, software comes in, right? CMS. No, that is where your computer-aided facility man uh, management comes in. Okay, computer your computerized maintenance management system only deal with the operation and maintenance of the assets. Okay. Okay. But your computer aided facility maintenance uh, management deal with the entire facility, which includes so operation and maintenance is just like a baby under the whole entire facility. Okay. Okay. Mm. All right. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Francis, I think I've answered your question. So I have a question. You, you jumped. Oh, oh, Mr. Oh, Mr. Chaos, please, please, oh. pardon me. No problem, sir. You must have, a, have a place in your heart to forgive me, please. <laughs> thank you, sir. Can I ask my question now? Please go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you very much, sir. I enjoyed your yes, lecture. Sir. I, yes, sir. you have luckily answered one of the, the questions I had. Uh, someone have asked it on the uh, need time between failures. Now, my other questions is this. If you, are, if you don't have a CMMS, you know, a computerized maintenance management system, how, at what interval should you be taking inventory of your items? In order to keep your update your records, at what interval do you re recommend one to be updating his uh, inventory? You know, that's one. 
Okay. My, sec my second question is, talking about uh, retention period for maintenance record. Now, what is the standard? Is three years okay? Because I just want to know the standard. Uh, uh, if three years is okay, what's the advantage of keeping that three years or two years instead of having a pile of files for six years or thereabouts? Or is there any standard number of years that one can recommend or for a particular group of assets that we like to know? Then finally, talking about work orders, if, if a client made a request for a service, as a facility manager, if I generate a work order for that service, do I need to take it back to him again for approval? He requested, oh my, for example, in an estate, my kitchen pipeline is leaking. I felt as a facility manager, for me to go and assess the situation, know what is needed and raise a work order. Do I need to go back to him again for approval? Thank you, sir. Okay, good. You have um, three questions. Yes, sir. I start with the first one that how often do you check your inventory to yeah. know what is required and what you needed to put in place? Yeah. Um, let me use the, a very, very common example because we are all familiar with generator. This is where Nigeria has taken us to. <laughs> <laughs> Assuming I'm a facility manager and I have a 100 kV generator. And my generator consumes 10 liters of diesel per hour. And averagely, I run this generator for five hours on a daily basis. So that means on a daily basis, I have to use 50 liters of diesel, right or wrong? Mr. Chaos, right or right. wrong? Right. Sir. Okay, good. Right. Sir. So I work Monday to Friday, Monday to Saturday. That is six days in a week. But the office shut down on, Saturday, on Sunday. We don't go to work on Sunday. So for that one week, I'm going to consume 300 liters of diesel, right or wrong? All right, sir. Okay. So within a month, I have four weeks in a month. So 300 into four will give me 1,200 liters of diesel for a month. Yes, sir. Abby? Yes, sir. So if my diesel level is getting to 300. What do you expect of me? I have to reorder, right? Yes, make an order. Because that 300 can only last me for only one week, right? Yes. It cannot take me for another one month. Yes. So no, that means yes. my reordering level is once in a month. Right or wrong? All right. So assuming I'm using times two, of that, I'm consuming times two of that liters of diesel. I'm consuming 2,400 liters of diesel in a month. So mm -hmm. how many times do you think I'll be holding for diesel? For in a week? No, 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 in a month. That means two times. Two times, right? yes. Yes. So the frequency of That's consumption right. of your inventory will determine your reordering level. Okay. Let me give you another example again. You are running your generator for 10 hours in a day. You run the office six times in a week. 10 hours multiplied by six. That gives you 60 hours, right? Yes. That means your generator has to work 60 hours every month. Mm. Then now, in a, in a month i have 240 hours in a month so that means i have to service my generator once in every month right or wrong you're right so that means how do i order every month i must order for engine oil i must order for fuel filter i must order for oil filter every month mm. if my usage now double my initial usage. That means my inventory level has to be, my reordering level has to be twice every month. Okay, yes. So I'm only using those as an example. So 
your consumption, your inventory mm -hmm. consumption will definitely mm -hmm. determine your reordering level. That is question number one. Yeah. Then I think question number two was related to, remind me again, I think number three was related to what order? Remind me of that question number two again. Yeah, the number two is on retention period. What is the standard retention period for your records? No, there is no any particular retention period for your record. It's all depending on how useful that record, record is. is to you. If the record of last year is no longer useful for you again, there's no need of retaining it. You can take it off. Oh. But if the equipment you are maintaining that record are still alive. You cannot pull away that record. You have to maintain it. So let's now assume you want to dispose of that equipment. You want to sell that equipment off. You can sell both that equipment and its record together. So you take the record of that equipment off your shelf. Okay. So there's no any particular year or whatever for it. Then in terms of work order, you know, there's something we call check and balances. Mm -hmm. Why do you have a supervisor, supervising technician? Because you know your technician can do and undo. That's why you have a supervisor to monitor them. Okay. Why do you have a facility manager? Because you know your supervisor needed somebody to be on his head. Hmm. Why do you have to have head of facility? That is what we call check and balances. When a tenant, for, exa for example, mm. make a request for a plumbing work, mm. you go there to go and assess. You mm. expended money, right? What of if you take the cost back to the woman that requested and she told you she hasn't asked you to go ahead? How do you defend that? Uh. Why did she invite me in the first place? Is it not to solve her problem? Oh, really? <laughs> Baba can be denied, Mr. Chaos. <laughs> but you know, once she put her signature, sign that you should go ahead, she can't deny it. Okay, the essence is for her to sign something, not she just orally to... tell me Google. Then the second thing is that, what of if your technician want to chop money? Or you are saying it's not possible? But that one is possible. And he just come up with a maintenance idea and say, oh, God, please sign. We need to change material. So I will vet that one. My own concern now is the client. Mm -hmm. Definitely, so anything coming from my technicians, I will vet it. I will go to it. Yeah. But the Mr. point Carlos, is that, okay. Is all, sir, let me call me. It all depends on the kind of policy you are running in your business. Okay. There are some businesses that the end user are the one that will make the request. Yes. So when they make the request, you now assign somebody to yes. go assess and itemize what the yeah. issues are. Once they itemize, you get cost. You send cost for approval. Once they approve, you go ahead and repair. Yes. Right? Okay. There are some that you are the one that you go to. Here. You saw what is bad. Mm -hmm. You itemize, you get it fixed. So Whichever policy you are running in your company will determine the process your maintenance or your work order process is going to take. It's not that there is a standard one for everybody. It's all depend on the policy and the process that is allowed in your facility. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Thank sir. you very much. I think uh, Ms. Enon, you raised your hand the other time. Please come up with your question. Mm -hmm. I think I pronounced that in very well. No, you did not. Good evening, sir. Okay, echo. Yeah. yeah. Good evening, echo. Yeah. Uh, okay, someone has asked my question, but uh, my network was bad. I just want to get this CMMS thing. Right. That is com Computer, com yes. com computerized. Computerized maintenance no, management no, no, no. system. Yes. yes. C because M M S. During the class, you were explaining um the I think something about computerized aids 
maintenance system and um, so you you made some differences but i didn't get it clear at all no i i, I think i make a kind of a comparison between cmms and cafa cafa okay. is your computerized facility a uh, computer aided facility management mm -hmm. computer aided facility management so CMM is just a subset under CAFA. So your CMM only deals with operation and maintenance. Why your CAFA takes care of the whole thing? Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you, sir. You're much welcome, uh, uh, Mr. Sorry, Victor. Sir. Please let me just quickly pick Mr. Victor. Those, uh, question. Okay, sir. My, Mr. Vito, sir, good Mike, it's good not evening, actually, Mr. Vito. It's not actually a question. I just wanted to know the meaning of MBWA. Why you were talking on maintenance checklist? Is management by wandering around, <laughs> or by walking around? Management by walking around. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Mr. Francis, I can still see your hand up. You still have another question? Yes, sir. Okay. I, yes, I have, I have a question. And I, before the question, I want to just add to what you explained to Dama Oga concerning uh, the client signing a request that he made. So okay. In, okay. in a real estate setup, you need every client to sign the request he or she makes because of uh, reconciliation. Because within a, number, within a year, you will have gotten too many requests from different flats, possibly, or even in the same flat for the same job, depending on how they manage their apartment. So at the end of the year, because they are paying you service charge and you are supposed to audit, they are supposed to audit you on how you spend their money and you're supposed to be a reconciliation. The occupant can deny giving you that job two or three times within the year. You can, the occupant can say, no, I did not, I did not ask for this because she's not putting that one in her head. She has her own core business that she's putting in her head. But with her signature, she cannot deny. I just wanted to have that, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Francis. You are, you are you're actually right. Yes, and secondly, for all these computer-based um, CMMS and CFM, is there a class that somebody can go, like, like SAP? I used SAP when I was working in an uh, oil and gas company. Of course, it was when they employed me that they started training me. But in this case, because we may be lucky to get a facility job in a very big organization, that is able to finance using the CMMS or CAFM. Is there a class that somebody can go and learn the usage of this as an auto operate it and before you get such job? It, it, it's not that you can learn. It's not that you can learn, you can. But the other thing is that when a facility is switching to a computer-based software, they will definitely train every concerned staff about that new software they are installing. Because okay. if you train on one particular software and you get job in another place, what of if the software they are using in that place is not what you are familiar with? Because it's not every facility that uses the same software. Yes. So if you are employed today in any facility, whatsoever software they are have in place, they will definitely train you about it. Okay. That doesn't rule out the fact that you can train on so many uh, software. You can contact Mr. Paul as regard as regard to that. Okay, thank okay. you. So I, 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 I just got you. an information that there is a class coming now as regards that. Okay, okay, okay. Because I I feel it's so important if we if there is that course that we should learn. Mm. Pending when we get the kind of job that uses that software. That, 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 uh, that is the class coming up. They can raise, yes, so they can raise your, your salary when you already have that skill. <laughs> 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 they, they, regard you more, 
they regard you more as a professional than somebody they have well, to Mr. Say, Mr. Mr. Francis, let, 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 let me help Sir. you by telling you everything is not all about money. Don't always, when it's come to no, no, I was just tissue, <laughs> don't always put money as a top yes. priority. No, I was just joking. You know. I was just joking, but it's I get your to, point. To, I get your point as well. <laughs> Mr. Chris and Mr. Taufik, I'll come back to you. Let me just quickly pick Mr. Vianana's question. Mr. Vianana. Okay, I just want to share experience. Uh, good, to, good to see your face today. <laughs> eyes work. Fine, thank you. I hope <laughs> eyes for Tarkot. Uh, for Tarkot is good. But I am at uh, Onne, where we are, we are struggling with bad roads. Hey, yeah, uh, so, so, sorry. <laughs> We, we we're looking forward to for you. Uh, we're looking forward to us you having like Lagos about the express with soon. Okay, um, they they are doing some survey currently. So a, a few weeks ago, the road was blocked by protesting youths, calling okay. government to come and uh, immediately fix. Okay, uh, okay, it okay. appears the government is not doing preventive maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on the lighter note, then just to share experience. In, okay, sir. Uh, in my organization, we have uh, an enterprise resource uh, program. We call it uh, ERP. It's a micro uh, Microsoft-based program, uh, Nav Vision. So that qualifies as your facilitated uh, computerized uh, maintenance uh, system. Okay. It is an integrated system where you can, uh, I, for I also double as a fixed asset coordinator in addition to my uh, oversight no. role in facility maintenance. So this same package is an integrated package where it is uh, all the modules in finance, asset management, uh, maintenance uh, requests, job orders are integrated together. It also has provision where you can also record maintenance activity but like our instructor will tell you it is not a computer a computerized maintenance man, uh, management system but it has an element so it is more like a bigger picture trying to integrate all this like even procurement is also tied to this like the inventory you can also see as you are taking your space you are seeing the stock balance so if you have set your minimum reorder level it is said you can trigger the, the request, the PRN, the uh, purchase requisition, when you hit your uh, minimum uh, reorder levels. So we have that kind of system. Then what I understand for the computer-aided maintenance system, those ones are usually associated with some of our equipment and systems in the plant, like water treatment system, for example. They have uh, uh, the filtration system. And there are also sensors integrated in that system that monitor uh, the water flow and the pressure through the filters. And each time, for example, it notices certain record, it gives the system an uh, uh, instruction to carry out certain maintenance action. There are also so, uh, pressure level, do a back flushing of the filter. So that, act that system will initiate that process which is like a preventive maintenance process to ensure effectiveness of that system. Also in our uh, gas turbine system, for the airflow system, there's also a differential pressure uh, uh, indicator on it that is also wired to that kind of system that will say, okay, when we notice a higher pressure, do a back flushing, probably the, the doors have plugged the system. So, will not have enough air flow into the gas turbine. So that system on its own will initiate that process of flushing out the dust in the system. So those ones are the, what you want to call it a, a computer managed maintenance system. But what I understand from my experience is that most times they're integrated to certain systems or equipment. Some of them come as part of the package. Then probably you could, you could also uh, initiate some of this thing through the uh, different uh, uh, system like uh, PLC, programmable, uh, programmable logic control logic system, that mm -hmm. you can also integrate to help you do some of these things. Thank you, Mr. Vianan. I really appreciate it. Because it's, it's, it's just like you rightly said, there are some that it's 
has some aspects of CMMS, but not CMMS particularly as a, a main software of CMMS, but they have some aspects. Then most of the time, when you want to choose your CMMS, the particular information you are trying to retrieve from the software should be the main, one of the factors that is guiding you to choose a particular software. Then, like I already said, when we're dealing with um, the other topic, I think on Tuesday last week, I said, before you choose any software, you need to do more or less like use your networking, ask from people who have been using it before, what are their challenges that they face, what are the advantage of them using them. The information they are also requesting from the software might not be the same thing that you want on your own at your own end. So you need to itemize what are, so at least if the software can give you almost about 90 to 95% of the information you want, why not? Go ahead for it. Go ahead for it. Thank you very much, Mr. Vianana. Mr. Christen, you still have another question. Mr. Give, I can see you, I'll come back to you. Let me just quickly attend to Mr. Christian. Mr. Christian Amos, do you still have another question? Okay, Mr. Gift, let's go ahead. Let me have your uh, let me have your question, Mr. Gift. Okay, Oh, it's Mrs. Oh, sorry, pardon me. I've just been corrected now. It's Mrs. I don't think there's another person raising hand. Okay. It seems as if I've answered all our questions. So in the absence of no question, can we call it a day? Yes, sir. So okay. thank you very much, everybody, thank for today. You, sir. However, however, sir, just one last question. Okay, sir, Mr. Akaios. Okay. Uh, I've been enjoying a number of these um, lectures, but um, a number of the topics we have dealt with, I'm interested in studying them more. Is there okay. any textbook or a material you can recommend to- Which particular know? area are you talking about? You can easily relate all your challenges to Mr. Pope. He has every okay. information at his disposal. He can be of help, seriously. Okay, it's all right. Mm. On any okay. particular, okay. yeah. Okay, thank you about that. Okay. You are much welcome, sir. Mm. Okay, in the absence of no any other question, you can call it a day. So I can be drawing the curtain from here and saying good night to everybody. Good night, sir. Good night, sir. Good night. Thank you very much. Yeah, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, ma. I just landed Kanu now. I've been in the air all this while. <laughs> oh, thank God for the same trip, ma. Thank you. So I, I, I want thank to guess you have me back from Abuja. Yeah, I'm in Kano right now. I left Lagos. Oh, okay. Please, when you are coming back from Kano, kindly help us get some kilichi. Okay, no problems. I hope I'll see you to give it to you. I'll get no to No problem. Just drop it with Barakat in the office. I'll be able to get it. <laughs> All right. you, can, you, can, you can just uh, send it by Zoom to me now. <laughs> No, I will so, send the real one. Uh, I will send the real one. No problem. Don't worry. Get it across to, to uh, Barakat. Then I will get it from her. All right. All Thank right. you very Thank much. You Thank very you very much. Hello, uh, bye. Bye. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yeah, hello. Sorry, I didn't get your name. This is, my, this is like my first class. I practically just joined the class. Oh, Mr. Rasa. Yes, sir. Sorry, my, my, my name is Akiola Emmanuel. Akiola, I prefer people calling me Emmanuel because my people from the east, where Jesus Christ comes from, they will tell, they will tell, they will call me Akinola. Okay. <laughs> so I always prefer people calling me Emmanuel. It's very easy. All right. Good night, Paul. Thank you Thank very you much, much, Mr. Rosa. All right. You're much welcome, sir. Okay. Bye, bye, sir. All Thank right. you. Bye. Yeah.